Channel 4 News begins right now with a local breaking news alert. That breaking news alert is from Cecil Commerce Center. We're told a construction worker has fallen from a hangar. And we just got off the phone with Jacksonville Fire Rescue when they tell us the worker has died. Channel 4's Jim Pickett is there at the scene and joins us live. Jim. You know, Mary, if you take a look behind me here, this is the hangar that's under construction. And we were told early on that when this occurred, there was severe weather going on. And the worker, we're told, was on the roof of this hangar and fell off. And as you had mentioned, minutes ago, we had learned that he had died from the injuries as a result of that. Now, we haven't heard from investigators out here at this point. JFRD is out here. And obviously, if we look inside, there are some people standing around inside with their hard hats on. We're not sure what they're doing, but we know that this is an active scene out here, that there is an investigation underway, and they will pass on to us exactly what happened, what led to all of this. If it was storm-related because of that, it does look like there was some, some weather out here at the time. It's overcast around here, and as we were driving up, it did look like there was some lightning, but we're not sure what role that played, but we did hear that from the fire department. But what we do know is that the worker here uh, at this construction site where they're building a new hangar. He passed away as a result of the injuries from this. This hangar is being built by Balfour Beatty uh, Construction. What this is for at this point, we're not sure. We hope to find that information out later. It's out here at Cecil Commerce Center. We're on Aviation Avenue just off of 103rd Street with lots of construction going on out here. But again, as you can see behind me, this is still a very active scene. We're live at Cecil Commerce Center. Jim Pigott, Channel 4 the local station. And we will continue to follow this breaking news and bring you any updates. If you're away from the TV, you can find those updates on news4jax.com and our Facebook and Twitter pages. The other big story we're following, the seasonal storms. This is video of one that soaked the south side. Right now, many of you may be seeing a clear sky, at least for a while. It's an early dip into June's monsoon season. All this week, storms have come early and often. And we got it again today. Chief Meteorologist John Gaughan is standing by to tell us where the latest round of rain is now. He joins us with a Weather Authority update. John? Tom, Mary, the folks in Baker County truly being pounded right now. Getting a lot of calls, Facebook images as well. As you can see, Live 5 Doppler radars, the activity is not in the downtown area. It's, it has all moved out. We do have the cloud overhang, and it doesn't look particularly pretty at the moment outside. But here it is, back in through parts of Baker County. You can see the particularly nasty storm about to come through. Oh, it looks like the Alusty area, southwestern parts of Baker, and there's Alusty there. Sanderson, you've seen it pretty bad here in the last 30 minutes or so. This storm will continue to track ever so slowly off towards the south. It'll take another, well, here, let me back it up. The actual leading edge will get through Alusty here in the next few moments. Uh, probably in the next 10 minutes or so. So again, Mount Carey way back out towards, uh, getting, getting close to 100 out here towards the uh, Lulu area. Uh, the, this storm here is the big one. It is the one that's going to cause the overhang of dark, ugly clouds over the downtown area. And again, in southwestern parts of Baker County, they could actually see a small piece of hail or two, but that will probably be about it here this evening. Just another look at the big picture before we start talking about Later on this evening, I want to point out there's another area of heavy thunderstorms now and through parts of southwestern Clay County. This is right near Keystone Heights. This will also move on off towards the south and west, and this too will produce some very heavy rainfall amounts over a very short period of time as it heads on off towards the Waldo area, which is getting a pretty good shower at this point. Keystone, you'll probably see that right in your backyard at a park of palms in about 10 to 15 minutes. Lightning here is all a little bit further back out to the east, and because of that, the storm's likely to linger. So we're talking about Baker County, southwestern Clay County being the bad spots in terms of heavy rains. And in downtown Jacksonville, we're looking okay for the moment. Tom and Mary, I want to show one more little detail to what's likely to happen to us over the next three days. Evening storms stay west. Tomorrow, another stormy afternoon. I'll detail that in a minute. But Sunday, Tom? What? I know. I know. That's I know. like a dirty uh, trick. you got to be making this up. The big story here is not so much going to get cool or all that wet, but the winds will be strong. We could see winds up to 30-plus miles an hour. That means people going to do some boating this weekend. Better be aware of a rapidly changing condition Sunday. We'll have more on that. Ah. Thanks, John, I think. Remember, you can track these storms through our Weather Authority app. It's free for Apple and Android devices. It has live radar and alerts for any weather, weather warnings or watches in your neighborhood. Just search WJXT in the App Store. We're following a breaking news alert on the west side right now, where police are looking for a man described as armed and dangerous. They evacuated a neighborhood and surrounded a home where they believed he was hiding. Six hours later, they discovered he wasn't there.
Here's his picture. 33-year-old Cornelius Mann is wanted for robbery. Channel 4's Kristen Cosby has, Cosby has been in that neighborhood since this morning. She's joining us now live. Kristen, are police still there? No, Tom, police left a couple hours ago, but first they spent almost seven hours in this neighborhood. You can see things have quieted down, but it wasn't like this all day. About 8 this morning, a woman told police that the man they were looking for was inside of her house. Diana Black saw this across the street from her grandchildren's daycare and immediately went to pick them up. Because these are my grandkids, and I don't want nothing to happen to them. From 8 this morning until 2.45 in the afternoon, the SWAT team surrounded a home on Centauri Lane. Police tried to convince robbery suspect Cornelius Mann to come out of the home. He's considered armed and dangerous. There's a lot of guns and a lot of cops out there. And they're all in my backyard. Neighbors also told us they never saw anyone in the home respond. Nothing. They get no response. You know, we kind of think maybe he's not even there, you know. I mean, since 8 this morning and the man's not giving up, he can't possibly be in that house. Sure enough, after throwing tear gas in the home and doing a thorough search, police told us the house was empty. Police work, this is what we do. Uh, we chase leads all day long. Um, some leads come out where that leads us to the suspect and some leads lead us to not the suspect and it's we have to chase down every lead. Now police are asking for your help, urging you to call them if you know where 33 year old man is located. And if you have seen Cornelius Mann, you can report him anonymously by calling Crime Stoppers. That number is 1-866-845-TIPS. Reporting live on the West Side, Kristen Cosby, Channel 4, the local station. Kristen, the woman who told police Mann was in that home, will she face any charges? Well, Tom, that is a question we asked police today. They wouldn't tell us, but they did say that they were talking to that woman a lot. And so it sounds like if they find that she's lied to them, she may face a few charges. Kristen Cosby reporting to us live from the West Side. Thank you, Kristen. Now, this is the second time in less than 24 hours that local police have been in some kind of standoff with a suspect. Last night in Orange Park, police surrounded a home on Willow Lane where a man barricaded himself for nearly five hours. Police eventually took the man into custody without incident. They've not released his name or said why he held them at bay. Fortunately, no one was hurt. Amid growing calls for his resignation, Veterans Affairs Secretary Eric Shinseki has stepped down. He offered his resignation to the president this morning, appearing to bow to the mounting pressure over the scandal that centers around allegations of delays in treatment and preventable deaths at VA hospitals. Channel 4's Adrian Moore joins us now with the latest on the crisis and what comes next. Adrian? Mary Shinseki made his first public appearance today since that scathing VA Inspector General's report. He apologized for how his agency mishandled the delivery of medical treatment and hiding wait times for veterans. Today, Governor Scott called his resignation a good first step in much needed reform in veterans affairs. President Obama said embattled Veterans Affairs Secretary Eric Shinseki offered his resignation, which he accepted with regret. He has worked hard to investigate and identify the problems with access to care. But as he told me this morning, the VA needs new leadership to address them. The president said the retired Army general did not want to be a distraction. Shinseki's resignation came after mounting pressure from veterans groups and from congressional members from both parties for him to step down as failings in the VA medical system long, sometimes deadly delays for care came to light. An initial internal audit by the Department of Veterans Affairs found questionable scheduling practices regarding appointments, signaling a, quote, systemic lack of integrity at some facilities. Just before meeting with the president, Shinzeki appeared at the annual conference of the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans. I extend an apology to the people whom I care most deeply about, and that's the veterans of this great country, to their families and loved ones whom I have been honored to serve for over five years now. Even with Shinzeki's departure, Republican House Speaker John Boehner wants more action. And until the president outlines a vision and an effective plan for addressing the broad dysfunction at the VA, uh, today's announcement really changes nothing. Deputy VA Secretary Sloan Gibson will temporarily step into the agency's top post as the White House searches for a permanent successor.
And in a statement released earlier today, Governor Rick Scott said, quote, today the Agency for Healthcare Administration submitted a Freedom of Information Act appeal. For the records, the Federal Department of Veterans Affairs has failed to provide by the deadline stated in public records law. This action is independent of the lawsuit. AHCA is preparing for the right to gain access to the VA hospitals. Today's news is a step forward, but our administration will continue to hold the VA accountable to the veterans they serve. And before meeting with the president today, Shinseki announced a series of steps to address the VA problems, including the removal of senior leaders at the Phoenix VA Hospital. Mary. Thank you, Adrian. And we're continuing to follow the story. Coming up at 6 o'clock, we're hearing from local lawmakers and their reaction to Shinseki's resignation. Find out who was in favor of the secretary stepping down. All new at 6. Jacksonville police are still asking for your help finding a missing woman. We first told you about the search last night on the 10 o'clock news. Her name is Kimberly Mackey. She was last seen Monday at her home on SUNY Pines Boulevard on the south side near Beach and Hodges Boulevard. She's 48 years old, about 5 feet 3 inches tall. She weighs 130 to 150 pounds. She has brown hair and brown eyes. Police fear that she's a victim of foul play. If you have information on her whereabouts, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers at 1-866-845-TIPS. Tough talk from Florida's Attorney General against same-sex marriage. She says it would harm the state. That's in a court document in a response to a lawsuit filed by eight gay couples against the state. What else Pam Bondi said ahead? And it's a program to keep children safe from online sexual predators. I'm Vic Michalucci, and after the break, I'll tell you how local, state, and federal authorities are helping you talk to your kids about the dangers they face. More people are looking for ways to save money, and they're cutting the cord on their cable. Yeah, they are saving a lot of money by doing this, but here's the thing. There are some drawbacks as well. We're going to tell you what they are, but also how much you can save at 645. Then coming up at 745, when you get a packaged food, you know, you read the ingredients in the food, but you really should be worried about what's in the package. Yeah, there's some items in there that could be making you sick. Details on that at 745. The Morning Show on Channel 4 makes mornings happen. 25 minutes. That's the amount of time law enforcement says you should take time out of your day to talk to your kids about modern day dangers, especially sexual predators lurking on the internet. This is all part of a new push to protect our children. They're calling it Take 25. John of Force Vic Michalucci talked to local, state, and federal authorities behind this campaign. He's joining us now on the South Bank to tell us what Take 25 is all about. Vic. Well, Tom, law enforcement officials say they are working so hard and devoting so many resources to catching these online child sex predators, as well as the traditional ones that lurk on the streets. But they say they need your help. Even if you're not a parent, maybe you've got a brother or sister, a loved one, somebody in your class, you need to take that precious time, just 25 minutes out of your day, and actually sit down and talk to them. They have this new Take25.org campaign. They're saying they don't care if it's class time, play time, dinner time, bedtime. Just devote some precious minutes to sitting down with your kids and talking to them about the dangers that are online and on our streets here in North Florida, South Georgia, and really all across the country. So today, there was a press conference with federal authorities, local authorities, the state attorney's office, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, FDLE. Those are just a few of those that say they're banding together to raise awareness of the problems because nowadays these predators, they don't have to go out onto the streets. They're just a keystroke and a mouse click away from talking to your children. So now they have all these resources online to make sure that parents know how to have that conversation with their kids. We prosecute so many cases here in the Middle District of Florida that involve child pornography and child <laughs> exploitation and even in many cases um, human trafficking in minors. Many of these cases end up in our office because adults have failed to educate the children in their lives about the dangers that are present. It takes a village to raise a child. It's, it's all of our responsibility to sit down, it, it, whether it's a, it's a friend's child, it's a, it's a grandchild, it's, it's, it's your own child. Take that 25 minutes. 
And authorities say they understand that a lot of parents and guardians don't really know how to talk to a kid. That's why they have Take25.org. It's also on Twitter and Facebook. You can go on there and actually download step-by-step -step directions on how to talk to your children about this very difficult subject. Coming up all new at 6 o'clock, we'll have another report on this initiative, and we'll hear from Summer Thompson's mother, Dina. Of course, she is the mother of the little girl who was abducted, raped, and killed in Orange Park several years ago. We're going to hear her reaction to this initiative. Reporting live, I'm Vic Michalucci, Channel 4, the local station. Always watching, always tracking. Channel 4 is the weather authority. Boy, there were some dark, scary skies out there, weren't there? No doubt. Uh, hail on the south side. It was a very narrow corridor. It was like really up and down. South side boulevard. All along 95, and, and the then, traffic right, was just crawling. But you could drive into the storm and then out of the storm Correct. and then back into, into the next storm. Exactly. And again, it was so focused right up and down, like I said, 9A295, just out to the west of it, all the way down 90. You so like said you that said, last night. I by know the way. exactly where we're going to drive. <laughs> he knew. He knew. <laughs> Look to the right of your screen. You can see the dark, ugly sky. And I was saying to myself, okay, this one's going to build to the north. Watch what really happened, though. Look at the swirling clouds above us. Wow. It yeah. went the other way. Oh, <laughs> so there I goes. see the dark. I thought I'd throw you a little barge to come rolling on through Thanks. just for fun. <laughs> Point of it is, is that, yes, they were dancing over the skies of Jacksonville earlier this afternoon. But as you look at 295 now, this is the region we we're really focusing on. There's 295, and this is Southside Boulevard all the way back out there towards about the UNF area. Very dark, very ugly, scary looking clouds, as mentioned, a lot of lightning and hail. And so it went this early afternoon. But tonight, it's now moved way back out to the west. So as we look at the big picture here, I want to show you, we don't have a lot going on. But where we do have it going on, it's going on pretty big. These little icons represent where the more intense, potentially could even go severe type storms. And as we look back out towards western and southwestern parts of Baker County, and if you're trying to figure out where the county line is here for Baker County, it goes up like this. And so we have Union County here. There's like Butler. Again, a lot of places here are going to be having graduation ceremonies, Clay, Baker, all the way out towards Union County, maybe a couple other counties out there as well. And as such, you need to be aware that these storms that are happening back out there in Baker County and out there in Union County, they'll be the areas that we'll see the rains continue for at least another two, maybe three hours, but not so much in Clay County. Those rains will continue to move on back out towards the east. So again, the important areas right now, we're seeing the storms clustered out here near Lake Butler. I think they'll continue to basically head down toward the south and southwest here. They're going to head like this. And so we'll probably see again, many of these areas here, see that storminess. Here, let me do that one more time, kind of jumped around. But Again, these are the areas that will likely see the worst of the storminess all the way through the next uh, 20, 30 minutes or so. Lake Butler, in about 12 minutes, you'll see the worst of this particular storm. That could include some small hail, some gusty winds up to around 25, 30 miles an hour. And then further out to the east, just to illustrate, once we get past 301, there are just a few isolated showers and storms. The other one's right here near Key Heights. And then we dry out from Middleburg, Green Coast Springs, back towards Orange Park. Things are looking up there. This storm out here near Keystone, I'll just kind of zoom in on this one as well because it too has had some signs of having at least some small hail associated with it. Uh, this part of the storm is tracking off well to the northwest, but I think it's more or less heading towards the south. At this point, not showing any particular na nastiness other than the fact that it is rotating. And these are the locations that will be impacted, not only including uh, Keystone, it will probably head on down towards Santa Fe Beach as well within the next half hour. That is all in the inland locations. If you live along the coast, skies may not be clear, but at least tonight you will remain dry along the beaches here. Rainfall amounts, here's the other little shocking detail. Second day in a row, none of the major reporting stations have shown any significant rains. We've stayed generally dry. That's how the live look of the Doppler, or how it looks live outside on the tower cam. Still pretty warm at Cecil, still pretty warm at the beach where they didn't see any rains. Temperatures will continue to cool on down. And as we get to about, oh, sunset tonight, the clouds will be out there, but the rain chances will fade. Heading to the beach this weekend, go tomorrow. Don't go Sunday. Sunday's going to be a wild one. Windy, very nasty conditions, possibly some rain, but tomorrow night. Southeasterly winds, 85 degrees. High tide coming up around the lunch hour. As we look at the surf forecast, it'll remain pretty low and then build up big. I'm actually going to make it pretty big for Sunday because I could see some pretty big surf move along the coast because of a nor'easter that moves in quickly in on Sunday. Tomorrow, lunchtime, showers begin to turn into big storms. That'll happen especially back out to the west. So as we look at the forecast real quick for the next night, uh, tonight we'll see skies continue to remain ugly out west. 
but not a lot of rain. We'll clear on out. Daytime highs tomorrow approach 90, cooler along the coast, but then we'll see those rain chances really build up late in the evening. I'm going quick here in a little remote control. Took a little bit of a break there, but here we go. Saturday, stormy, okay, in the afternoon hours. Sunday, first day of hurricane season, a few showers. Look at the daytime temperature. Tom, again, windy Sunday. Winds up to around 25, 30 miles an hour. Thank you, John. Wall Street has finished the month of May, hitting a new record. The Dow climbed 18 points today, closing at 16,717, three points higher than its previous peak. The Nasdaq fell five points, but the S&P rose three and a half points. He's now making an official push for the presidency, the presidency of Florida State. Why Senator John Thrasher is considered a front runner for the job, next. Now Mary has a preview of what's all new at six o'clock. Tom, here's some of what we're working on. A Putnam County man is arrested in New York, charged with hitting and killing a state trooper with his truck. What we're learning about the crime. Reaction from around the country to news of the resignation of Veterans Affairs Secretary Eric Shinseki. Our lawmakers are weighing in. And it's the big news. In a small town, there's a new truck route planned to US 301. What it will mean to drivers and start. Coming up at 530. Attorney General Pam Bondi says recognizing same-sex marriage in Florida would, quote, impose significant public harm. She made the comment in a court document she filed today. Eight gay couples and the American Civil Liberties Union are suing the state in federal court. They argue that Florida discriminates against these couples by failing to recognize same-sex marriages. Today, Bondi filed a response asking a federal judge to throw out the lawsuit. The filing also says same-sex marriage recognition would create significant problems for the state's pension and health insurance programs. One of North Florida's most in influential legislators has now formally applied to be the next president of Florida State. Senator John Thrasher of St. Augustine is now the lone candidate who will be interviewed during the search committee's next meeting in mid-June. According to a consultant, FSU hired for the search. The weight of Thrasher's name has been scaring off other candidates. Thrasher is chairman of Governor Scott's re-election campaign. He submitted a four-page cover letter and a five-page resume highlighting his love and passion for his alma mater. We continue to follow that breaking news from Cecil Commerce Center right now. We're told a construction worker has died after falling from the roof of this hangar at this construction site. It's not clear how it happened, but we're just moments away from finding out more. Officers are expected to give us an update at around 530. And as soon as they do, we'll bring that to you live. You know about food trucks and you know about firefighters. Well, how they're coming together this weekend for a good cause and how you can help while doing some good eating next. A weekend family event promising food and fun, all to support a great cause. The Firefighters Food Truck Festival is tomorrow, hosted by the Firefighters Union. Organizers promise a real food truck competition. They're raising money to help children who have debilitating diseases. Six former Jaguars will be the judges. There will be 15 art and craft vendors, fire truck demonstrations and tours, water slides and more. It'll be held at the Firefighters Union Hall at the corner of Stockton and Phyllis Streets. The festival begins at 11 a.m. and will go until 6 p.m. Stay with us. There's more to come. The news continues with Rob and Adrian. Channel 4 News begins right now with a local breaking news alert. We're going to take you straight to a news briefing that's going on right now from Cecil Commerce Center, where a construction worker has died after falling from the roof of a hangar. The Jacksonville Sheriff's Office is at the scene with an update now on the situation. Let's go to that news conference right now. Hi, I'm Sergeant Dan Jansen I'm with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office Homicide Unit. Approximately 3.30 this afternoon, uh, we were called out to Cecil Field in reference to a construction accident where a worker was working on a roof of a hangar that's under construction, and he was switching from one rafter to another. Uh, he untethered one rafter, went to switch, step to the other rafter to tether up, and he lost his footing, I guess, from the wind or what have you, and um, he fell. and. Uh, he died on uh, at the scene on impact. It was, uh, from my understanding, it's about 120, 125 feet roughly from the top of the hangar to the ground. Um, he lives out of state. He's just down here doing the construction work with a company. Uh, we're still looking into the exact company. My understanding, it's IMC Erector is the name of the company. Um, 
He's uh, his name is Lopez. First name is Jose. Jose Lopez. He's a Hispanic male, 26 years of age. Um, is there any questions that you? Might I, have? I guess. I guess if you could tell us, it was weather related and a possibility. Well, uh, it's hard to say at this point. Uh, we're hearing that it was partially that there was some wind up there and that maybe he lost his footing, but I can't say if it's because of the wind or if he just lost his footing or what the cause was. Sergeant Jansen, at the moment he was harnessed in and was switching to another harness? The way it was told to me was he was tethered on one rafter. He untethered, went to step to another rafter and he tethered to tether up and that's when he lost his footing. So Nobody there else. Are some fall protection devices in place and I'm assuming that that tether was part of that. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Nobody else hurt in this, obviously. No, nobody and, else hurt. Do you know what happened right after the fact? Did they get help here immediately? or do you Oh, know? yeah, yeah. They called for help uh, immediately and called for rescue, and rescue came, and but he was pronounced on the scene. And were there any other workers on top of the roof with him at the time when it happened? Yes, there were. Do we know how many? I don't know the exact number at this point. Do you know what how happens long now? he's been working at this hangar? I'm sorry? I was saying, what happens now? Is OSHA out here? Or you well, we've contacted OSHA, and uh, we'll get a hold of the medical examiner's office. They'll come out, and we kind of have a collaborative investigation between the three of us, and, and we'll see where we would go from here. I'm sorry. Uh, did you say how long he had been working at this hangar? Uh, he was hired on the 12th of May, um, so I, I'm assuming that that's when he started work on this hangar. Is it proper procedure to tether from the second location before untethering from the other one uh, i'm not a construction worker so you know i, I would be speculating. so that's really the situation what we heard out here uh 26 year old jose lopez fell from this construction site and he died out here recently hired out here at this firm so that's the situation here out at cecil's commerce center jim pig at channel four the local station all right, thank you, Jim. Well, the other big story we're following has to do with the seasonal storms that come early and often. The question now is what's in store for tonight? Around our area right now, skies are a little gray over downtown Jacksonville. Chief Meteorologist John Gahn has been monitoring the conditions and joins us now with what we can expect. John? Once again, Rob, Adrian, the big storm started on the south side and there very well could have been a large gust of wind that had pushed westward across the river and pushed all the way out towards Cecil Commerce Center. You can actually see the runways right in through here. But the storms were here earlier on, up and down around the 9A area, right in through here. Then they kind of moved southward and then they fizzled. But now you can see clearly most of the rains are back out towards the swamp, all the way back out towards I-75. Baker County, things are just kind of going to a drip dry mode at this point after the big rains in the last hour or so. The heaviest of storms right out here near Lake Butler. You can see them really coming down. As we zoom on in, you can see that potentially maybe even a little hail associated with this particular cell itself as it'll continue to dump some very intense rainfall amounts all around Lake Butler. This is again County Highway 231. And you can see that going southward, just south of Lake Butler. So this storm will probably continue to move on off towards the southwest. Not moving fast here, folks. So if you're out there near Dana and Dukes, you're going to see that uh, big downpour head in your general direction. Now, getting back closer to Jacksonville, I just want you to understand it's a very busy night for a lot of folks because tonight is graduation night for a lot of counties. In Duval County, you can see not looking bad. Out there towards Clay County, rains for about the next half hour to an hour. That means to about 7 o'clock, then things will improve there as well. Storms will be mainly well out west. Tomorrow, another stormy afternoon, but I want to remind everybody, one day to the next, it'll change. If you're thinking about going fishing, doing some offshore boating, or maybe even around town, a little mini nor'easter with winds to 30 miles an hour, Rob and Adrian. It's going to be a Wednesday on Sunday this weekend. All right. Thank you, John. Well, they're making their voices heard across downtown. Protesters calling for the removal of State Attorney Angela Corey have now taken their message to the center of the city in Hemming Plaza. That's where we find Channel 4 Scott Johnson. He is joining us now live with more on this. Scott? Yeah, Rob, this is the second uh, demonstration against Angela Corey's performance as state attorney tonight. Today, there's one this morning. I'm going to show you this. You'll notice there's a good amount of people here, but it's not a packed protest. They say there's a reason for that. Today, they say it's a chance to teach people about Angela Corey. Anyone who's been affected by her performance as state attorney, they want to teach her about what they say the job that she's been doing, which they say is woefully inadequate. Um, everything from the prosecution of George Zimmerman to Michael 
Russell Dunn to the recent controversy over civil citations and not giving enough to minors in Duval County and in their opinion putting too many kids in Duval County in jail and giving them a permanent criminal rap sheet. They're pointing a lot of this at Angela Corey. And this is the second protest, as I said today. Some people just say they're not happy with how she's doing her job. We right here, to, um, you know, we support, we support what, what's going on with, you know, paying Bundy. What she got, you know, just trying to stop, reduce um, black on black crimes in our community. Uh, we also, we also supporting that, um, trying to get rid of Angela Corey now, you know, because she had caused so many tears in our family, in our communities, and our youth are suffering from her from her destruction to our black and brown community. And Angela Corey has dealt with a lot of these protests as of late, being involved in such high-profile cases. They sent me a statement earlier this week for a different protest, and they say, Scott, the same statement applies today. That is, the state attorney's office has a duty to protect this community and seek justice for all our victims. We're live downtown. Scott Johnson, Channel 4, The Local Station. Scott, we know we heard from the state attorney's office a couple of days ago. Is that the same uh, uh answer they have today or yeah, have we heard yeah it is different? rob okay all right yeah they've had a few of those uh in the last few days they've had to continue to put out these statements uh defending themselves and they are every time rob they are continuing to say hey we're going to defend the job we're doing in the fourth district here the fourth circuit and say that we're not doing a bad job like a lot of these naysayers are saying angela corey is doing so they are not taking this lying down in the state attorney's office rob all right scott johnson reporting to us live thank you scott Covering Bradford County this evening, a highway alternative meant to make a city safer and cut down on traffic is causing big concerns and fears for some business owners. The Department of Transportation is planning to start construction on a truck route to US 301. It would skirt around the city of Stark. The construction does not start for another two years, but some local stores, hotels and restaurants are all scared. It will take away their traffic and their livelihood. Channel 4's Vic Michalucci spoke with both sides. And I'll have that right up for you, ma'am. Powell's Dairy Freeze is a staple in Stark. <laughs> Off 301 for more than 40 years, known for its old-fashioned hamburgers <laughs> and ice cream sundaes. Thank you, and you have a blessed day. But workers here are worried about their futures when the Department of Transportation builds an alternate route around the city. This truck route is going to hurt everybody. The big corporations, they can move left and right, on-ramp, off-ramp. Little businesses like us, we don't stand a chance. We depend on the 301 traffic. FDOT officials say there are traffic issues galore on 301 in Stark because a lot of semis come through. With the trucks come crashes, safety issues, and noise. So this bypass is going to be actually a new road that veers off US 301 about two miles north of the city limit. It loops around for about seven miles and then rejoins the highway two miles south of town. The $120 million project set to start in summer 2016 is getting mixed reviews from drivers. Robert Nason says he sits in bumper to bumper traffic in the morning and afternoon and can't wait for the construction. I've been living here for 20 years and we need it with these 18 wheelers tying the road up. The traffic has quadrupled in the last 20 years and it's been astronomical trying to get down to Jacksonville or to get back up to I-10. It's been bumper to bumper and we do need it and I needed something to improve the road system. But others say the 70 mile an hour alternative will be a horrible blow to the mom and pop shops that rely on those who pass through. The small businesses are really all we have. You know, you got to be able to build something and if there's no, there's no traffic, you know, there's no ability to bring new customers in, you can't build a business. You can't, you don't have any income. So there's no way to get a start. And Stark's mayor, Carolyn Brown Spooner, tells me that she understands the concerns from business owners and citizens in her city, but she thinks in the long run this will actually be a good idea. She thinks that there's already a lot of traffic and safety issues that cause people not to go through Stark. She thinks that if the trucks are out of the area, more families and travelers will actually pass through, use the gas stations, the restaurants, and the hotels. She thinks in the long run, the economic impact will be positive. I'm Vic Michalucci, Channel 4, The Local Station. Water problems for some people in Neptune Beach. A boil water advisory has been issued for parts of the area. It's in effect from now until Monday afternoon. The areas affected include Kings Road, Indian Marsh Drive, 
Bucknell Cove, Nightfall Drive, Big Chief Gate, Big Tree Road, Arrowhead Trail, and everything west of Hopkins Creek. Now again, anyone who lives on these roads must boil their water before drinking, cooking, or brushing your teeth even. From now until 3 p.m. Monday. In Arlington, we now know the name of the man killed while driving along the Arlington Expressway last night. Florida Highway Patrol says 20-year-old Connor McNally was near the Southside Boulevard interchange when he crossed into the median and hit an embankment. That caused him to go airborne and crash into a concrete dividing wall. Troopers say McNally was wearing a seatbelt and alcohol was not a factor. A bittersweet day at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The emotional exchange between a White House employee and his employer. But first, it's been a wet start to the weekend. Weather even delaying this regional track meet out at UNF. John will join us with an update on what you can expect tonight and this weekend. That's next. Tracking inconvenient weather where you live. Channel 4 is the weather authority. Some wild weather to kick off the weekend. Actually, you know, when it's uh, <laughs> not too, too bad like today, I had the opportunity to go actually look outside. I see. Okay. And see the storms bubble up because, you know, a lot of times when it gets kind of nutty, I got to get right there. Radar, to the radar is one thing. The window is another. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so we'll look at the radar and you'll see why things have settled down, at least for Jacksonville. And it doesn't look pretty outside. I'll show you that as well. But take a look at the radar right now. And what you're going to find is that the rains are not in Duval County. The gray, ugly skies, they are hanging over our heads. But in terms of actual rainfall, that happened earlier on. Sea breeze came in just as it was pretty much predicted to do so. And that's turned all these rain showers kind of away from us. And so that's pushed all the activity back out through parts of oh, mainly Baker County. Really seeing a lot of heavy rain here in the last hour or so. So here is Baker County. You can see right here the outline of the county right through here. Yeah, there's McClaney all the way back out to our Lusty, which has seen some very serious heavy rains there as well. But from 301 westward, that's where the rains are east of there, not so much. Heading southward into Clay County right now, and you can again see that the rains are really concentrated right out here near Keystone Heights. Now, the thinking I had earlier, just in the last 15, 20 minutes, was we were going to see that this was going to move off towards the southwest, and instead it's just kind of raining itself out. The more likely uh, condition is that we're going to start to see the rains fill in between, oh, Keystone and back out here towards Gainesville, McNopee, and then back out towards Hawthorne. So you guys are next. So, so I'll put the next here. Uh, that's where the storms will start to redevelop in that direction. But also notice the severe or nearly severe storm that's going on here south of Palatka right now. So Putnam County, you're on the lookout for all this mess, and it continues to basically move ever so slowly off towards the northwest. So I'll just kind of draw where the worst of the storm is likely to go as it's coming off of Buffalo Bluff, and that's pretty much just southwest of uh, Palatka. There's Hunter there, and you can see that uh, extending all the way back out towards Interlochen. And a lot of this area here likely to see some very intense downpours, though. and not only that, but the lightning is looking pretty bad. This is a 20 all the way back out west there, and you can see as we're looking at the street level where the worst of the storms are, these will continue to basically rain themselves out heavily here. I'm going to do one little, one more trick here just to kind of illustrate all the details, but I'm suspicious of this storm potentially becoming severe, and it does not appear it'll do that, but let me just get some of the information out of it real quick. And what you're looking at here is that this part of the storm is being sampled by the radars, and it's not a tornado. TVS represents a tornado. Yes, it is rotating. Yes, it has some severe hail, but the probability of hail is pretty high now, and the maximum size of that hail just below the threshold of going severe. So once again, Putnam County seeing the worst of it. That's downtown right now. You can see temperatures still very warm because we didn't see the rains. Here's how those storms really exploded right up and down I-95 and then moved back out to the west. This evening, straight forward, I-75 will see the worst of the storms. Gainesville, you're next. Then there's tomorrow. Tomorrow's looking awesome. I am heading to the beach. Adrian, head to the beach. Rob, go to the beach. Because tomorrow's going to be very, very pleasant. And it's going to be a nice summer-like day. High tide will be around the lunch hour. That's sometimes a little tough because the beach gets a little narrow. But the key thing here is the surf's going to build up by the time we get to Sunday. Because on Sunday, what will happen is our winds are going to go about 180. From the south today to the northeast and that's going to bring us a much colder temperature, cooler temperatures, and also bring us some big chances of high winds. 
3 o'clock tomorrow. Remember, it's just like today. It has been all week long, summer-like. So at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there are those thunderstorms between I-95 and 301. They'll wash themselves out between then and about 7 o'clock at night, just like they've done so all week long. Tomorrow, early morning temperatures, nice, right around 70, 71 degrees. You want to go offshore and do some fishing? Don't wish about it. Just do it tomorrow, but not by Sunday. 90 tomorrow, only 80-ish by Sunday as that northeasterly wind really cranks up a notch. Morning sunshine for your Saturday, hot, and then storms roll in. Make it just another 7, kind of stuck in a rut here. As we have 90, then only 81, we kick off hurricane season. Cool, breezy conditions. Rob, Adrian, look at those three words. Pleasant, pleasant, and pleasant again, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. All right. Thank you, John. We will certainly take it. All right. Thanks, John. The start of the hurricane season is this Sunday, but tomorrow is the start of the hurricane tax-free season. Certain essentials that you might need in case of a hurricane will be tax-free tomorrow through June 8th. Some of those items include a flashlight that you can get for $20 or less, a weather radio for 50 bucks or less, and maybe you need a portable generator. You can get that for $750 or less, and a first aid kit under 30 bucks. There's much more. If you'd like a complete list, all you have to do is go to our website, newsforjacks.com, and look for the hurricane section under the weather tab. Well, it's been three years of nonstop news conferences and building questions from reporters on some of the country's biggest stories. The familiar face moving on from the White House press room still to come. Plus, picking up your prom date can be stressful enough. Yeah, but imagine how nerve-wracking it must be if <laughs> your date is Malia Obama. More on the milestone for one of the first daughters and how the president is reacting when we come back. Now here's Tom with a look at what's ahead in the next half hour. Tom? Adrian, coming up at 6 o'clock, we continue to follow the breaking news alert on the west side where a worker has fallen to his death at Cecil Commerce Center. We're told the man lost his footing on the roof of a hangar under construction. We'll have an update from the scene. And talking to your children to help them stay out of the clutches of predators, local, state, and federal authorities have launched a campaign how they hope it'll save lives. Plus, VA Secretary Eric Shinseki has resigned in the face of the veterans' health care scandal. How Governor Scott and some local members of Congress are reacting. Join us for these stories and more at 6 o'clock. Here's this week's Vistar All-Star Athlete. Madison Cola is being recognized for outstanding achievement in athletics, academics, and community service. She's on the soccer team at Keystone Heights High School and named Gainesville Suns Player of the Year. She's a member of the National Honor Society, and her volunteer work includes working at Chance Hospital in the Pediatric Care and Bone Marrow Transplant Unit. Madison currently has a 4.2 GPA. You can watch her interview with sports director Sam Gavaris tomorrow during the 7 a.m. hour of the morning show and on Sunday during the 10 o'clock news. He's been the messenger of news for nearly every major story out of the White House over the last three years. And tonight we have learned... He's stepping down. Yeah, Jay Kearney, the White House press secretary, announced his resignation today. Now, we caught the goodbye between he and his boss. Yep. Any questions? <laughs> Kearney was the second press secretary during the president's more than five years in office. But to the president, he was much more than that. Here's what he had to say. Part of his One of Jay's favorite lines is, I have no personnel announcements at this time, uh, but I do, and it's uh, bittersweet. Uh, it involves one of my closest friends here in Washington. Uh, in April, Jay came to me in the Oval Office and said he was thinking about moving on, and I was not thrilled to say the least. Well, Connie says he'll leave next month, Deputy Josh Ernest. We'll take his place. But there's also some latter news out of the White House tonight. It seems that a teenage rite of passage has come knocking on its doors. The president revealed earlier today his daughter Malia recently went to her first prom. He wouldn't say whether Malia actually had a date or just went with friends and joked saying that it was all classified information, of course. <laughs> 
Unfortunately, we don't have a picture of the prom dress, but the president did say it was, quote, a little bit jarring to see his 15-year-old in heels for the first time, but also added that Malia looked beautiful. I'm uh, sure she did. It's I tough for any see, dad. I know to see go well to the prom, yeah. especially if she had a date. Well, and she's got the makeup. I know my dad was very firm with the handshake sun on everybody. There were a few few of my dates that Did he follow you? <laughs> he didn't follow me. <laughs> tracker at least, on the at car. least that I know of. A GPS tracker on the car? <laughs> no. No, no, no. Nothing like that. All right. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. The news at 6 with Tom and Barry starts right after the break.